From the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I am joined today by... You know it. Buzz, buzz, buzzy Cohen. Thanks for having me, Sarah. When you said you know it, I thought Michael Davies might be like dropping in from the ceiling and taking my place. But I'm happy to be here. Always happy to be talking. Well, about if things. he was, we would have already heard about Johnny That's Gilbert true. on the axe. That is true. So that is true. It could be none other than you. Um, I do want to talk about you and I kind of going viral. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but a lot of people picked up on us telling people to wager bigger last week on our podcast. And you know what? I stand by it. I kind of felt like I got bullied into that you know it went viral there's some clickbait about it and i was like i was just supporting my buddy buzz buzz but uh yeah jeopardy bosses i stand by it and you're apparently a jeopardy boss because I... <laughs> we are disappointed in low wagers if news you didn't hear to me it. news to me yeah i feel like that's not exactly what we said but regardless Doesn't um i'm happy people are listening and taking our words to the people yeah or at least some of our words i'm not telling you to bet at all i'm just telling you to get comfortable with betting bigger yeah. And we'll look at these, this week's shows and see if that pans out. Let's look. But first, very special week here for the Jeopardy family. Our own Ken Jennings has a new book, 100 Places to See After You Die. It's hitting bookstores tomorrow. Wow. And Ken is going to be very busy in the coming days. You know, he's doing a lot of press. He's got an appearance on The View. He's kicking off his book tour. He'll be stopping in Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, Salt Lake City. And later in today's episode, he's going to stop by to talk with Buzzy and me about the new book. That's right. Even with his hectic schedule, Ken always willing to make time for his Inside Jeopardy team. Yeah, that interview coming up. Can't but wait. first, we have last week's games to highlight. So cue the beep boops. We kicked off the week with returning champion and self-declared dorkopotamus from Texas, Jared Watson, going for his third win against challengers Harrison Seidel and Annabelle Winter. Jared controlled the board for most of the Jeopardy and Double Jeopardy rounds with 12 correct responses in each of those, including all three daily doubles. He was incorrect in final Jeopardy, but it did not matter. He had already secured a runaway and a third victory. First show out of the gate. Okay. Three daily doubles. Here we go. 1,000, 3,000, 2,000. Here's a chance. Maybe on the last one you want to bet small because you've got that runaway going on. But the $3,000 daily double, that, that first one in Double Jeopardy, could have stretched himself even further. I do want to also mention that Jared, who was on Reddit after uh, his game, shared some thoughts. What's becoming clear to me is that the hardest part of watching yourself is seeing your mistakes. And there have been plenty for me to have to absorb over these games. And today is no different. So far, they have thankfully not been fatal. I feel that, but I also, Jared, I want to remind you that when you watch, there are probably things that you came up with that even watching back, you didn't, you that can't you know. still don't even yeah, know that, that you happened, knew that. Yeah. You're like, where did that come from? I hear that from so <laughs> many champions. Jared, also a musician like yourself, Bussy. Yeah. You know, he shared a video of himself playing a very impressive rendition of the Jeopardy theme. And he had all these different camera angles. He was playing all these different <laughs> instruments. I tell you, the Dorkopotamus from Texas, he's just continuing to surprise me in many, many ways. He returned on Tuesday to face Suresh Krishnan and Deborah Clayman. Jared found the first two daily doubles, but he missed them for a total loss of 7,000. He was betting big like Buzzy said to do. However, he still managed to maintain the lead heading into finals. So I think your theory could be correct, okay. Buzzy. Unfortunately, Jared was incorrect in final, and Suresh became our new champion by a mere $201 difference. Wow, that is a close game. Um, I do want to say that an important part of my bet big on the Daily Doubles theory is to also get them correct. Uh -huh. However, you know. <laughs> details, details. But I think, you know, getting those Daily Doubles shows how in control Jared was of this game. You know, 28 uh, correct responses in any game is really, really impressive. Narrow loss. Jared missing two final Jeopardies in a row. Um, when he comes back for the champion's wild card, yes. that might be something he wants to work at. I know when my team was getting ready for uh, All-Stars. Oh, you're very, very prepared team. Which did not do very well. Didn't end up proving to be as beneficial, but the time was put in. But the time was put in. We can't <laughs> look back uh, saying we didn't prepare. But one of the things I really focused on was just 
Final Jeopardy because Final Jeopardy clues are written a little bit differently than the regular game. And so, you know, Jared, as you prepare, start thinking about maybe just doing some Final Jeopardy drilling. But I want to also congratulate Suresh on a gutsy come from behind win. And I want to point out one of my favorite categories, S-less chaps. (laughs) You know, whenever you can have some S-less chaps. Right on on the line, right? (laughs) On Jeopardy, you know it's a great day, although not so easy for our contestants. After two triple stumpers in the category, Jared joked, this is going great. But Deborah and Suresh were able to respond correctly to one each in that category. So at least, you know, it, it ended on a high, and I certainly... Loved seeing that because I love our writers. And, you know, I loved how confident Suresh was in final. He didn't know he was going to have a come from behind win, but he wrote down his response and he was just bopping to the think music, yeah. really enjoying those 30 seconds and, and seizing his moment. Yeah. When it comes to you, just write it down. Write it down <laughs> and then bop <laughs> and, your And then head. vibe. Just vibe. <laughs> well, moving on to Wednesday, Suresh is back facing Christine Remback and Colette Lee. Suresh took an early lead coming out of the Jeopardy round, but all three of our contestants struggled in double Jeopardy. With just five correct responses and a daily double, Christine was actually able to take the lead over Suresh heading into final. Unfortunately, Christine unable to come up with the correct response, and Suresh... For a second time, he's got a come from behind win, and he's now a two day Jeopardy champion. Well, Suresh has to be praying to the final Jeopardy gods because it has saved him now twice in a row. Uh, I love it for him. I, I think going into final, not being in the lead, you're like, okay, well, you know, there's a chance it feels like you got to, luck's got to be on your side. So Suresh has had two of those like wow moments, two games in a row. I want to point out a category here that I really liked, which was 90s kid. Uh, ah. As you may know, I'm working <laughs> on a little uh, 90s I do. trivia I book. Do. Uh, so I was all over these. I do love that Tamagotchi is a portmanteau of egg and watch in Japanese. But yeah, lots of really fun stuff to revisit here in that category. I loved Colette Lee's wardrobe. You know, she's a teacher. She was sporting the teacher vibe, but in such a great way. She had apples on her sweater. She had apple pie earrings. <laughs> One thing not so great about this game, and actually Christine and Colette joked about it in the post game chat, they were really hoping that they wouldn't go viral for leaving so much money on the board. In this game, this has to be a record 23 triple stumpers yeah. and it's something we never like to see no not good maybe something you know it's the last game before lunch maybe everyone's a little sleepy or something a little hungry but yeah that's that's a tough stat to to carry with you uh thankfully <laughs> i've seen nothing going viral about it so it's not going to go viral we mentioned it briefly here on the pod and uh, we'll forget it ever happened we'll forget it ever happened and now a quick word from our sponsor That's the sound of another sale on Shopify and the moment another business dream becomes a reality. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're selling books or bow ties, Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel, from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. You can customize your online store to your style, connect with new customers to drive growth, and even maintain the relationships that will keep them coming back no matter how big you want to grow. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. What's incredible to me about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify is there to empower you with the confidence and control to take your business to the next level. Now, it's your turn to get serious about selling and try Shopify today. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash jeopardy, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash jeopardy to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash jeopardy. Now, back to Inside Jeopardy. All right, Suresh returned on Thursday to go for his third win against Allison Streckel and David Ford. Allison started off strong in the Jeopardy round with 13 correct responses and continued to dominate in double Jeopardy, 
But Suresh chipped away at the lead, and with the help of a $5,600 true daily double, Suresh was able to get within striking distance of Allison heading into final. Once again, Suresh with a come from behind win with the correct response. Win number three for Suresh. It's like he listened to you, buddy. It's like he listened to me. First and it of was all, the difference. Suresh and Jared together could be a very <laughs> dangerous. We talked about a, a couples tournament. Maybe there's a, t- I don't want to bring back teams. Team, no. the all-star mm-hmm. teams thing was rough. We'll talk about that on another episode. But Suresh, I love the big gutsy daily double. Puts him in striking distance just in time for his strongest round i mean he's killing it in final jeopardy this is now three for three in final three for three come from behind wins suresh you know what candles did you light uh, the night before you know the summoning circle that suresh did (laughs) must have been incredibly powerful i want to know your secret well as we head into friday closing out the week the secret is out that suresh is going for his fourth win against vicky sear and tim haygood suresh got off to a good start but really heated things up in the double jeopardy round 12 correct responses and a daily double, ending the round with a score of $15,800, and it's a runaway. So he's heading into the weekend with a really great boost of confidence, knowing that, hey, he's got four games under his belt. Suresh, congratulations. You're doing it all. You got a runaway. You get come from behind wins. You get true daily doubles. Congratulations again to Suresh, who will spend the weekend as a four-day champion. And now, let's welcome Ken Jennings to the pod. All right, well, let's welcome Jeopardy host Ken Jennings to the pod. 13 books, Ken, and a new wow. one coming out tomorrow. Lucky number 13 hits bookstore <laughs> shelves tomorrow. Congratulations, Ken. I just want to say I remember, I think the first time I ever met you was at the draft for All Stars. And at that point, you said you had this book in your mind that you were working on it. So. That was a long road to getting from there to yeah, here. It's been years. And I just want to <laughs> congratulate you because that's a big triumph. It got slowed up. COVID slowed it up. All the libraries closed, so I couldn't do my exhaustive research. Well, I think one thing that was certain, you know, 20 years ago when you went on your impressive run, it seems like, you know, right after that ended, you knew that this would afford you an opportunity to be an author. That was something I think was always a dream and that your Jeopardy success kind of allowed you to start realizing. Yeah, I was an English major in school, and I never really thought that was a career. The joke somebody told me once, which I have gotten a ton of mileage out of since, is uh, (laughs) what's the difference between an English major and a large pepperoni pizza? And the answer, of course, is that the pizza can feed a family of four. (laughs) I took that to heart, and I went into computers instead. But after Jeopardy in 2004, when I got an offer to write a book, I thought, Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the thing I do with my life because I didn't know you could be a professional ex Jeopardy contestant. <laughs> I mean, Buzzy and I are maybe the only two on earth, right? <laughs> right? You guys are making James it look good. James, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, he's doing okay with that too. I got to ask Ken, Afterlife as a concept. Yeah, so the book, 100 Places to See After You Die. Not before. Not no, mm-hmm. it's a travel guide to the world to come. Different versions of the afterlife, as imagined by everybody from the ancient Egyptians up through Dante and his Inferno, all the way up to TV shows like Black Mirror and The Good Place. So hundreds of years of of human imagination about what lies beyond. And obviously, Buzzy was there when you were first thinking about this idea. But when it was just ten places, <laughs> <laughs> I but thought you were going to say obviously Buzzy was there in the afterlife. I continue to haunt you. <laughs> Buzzy does seem He's like my everywhere. fussy guardian angel from a 1970s movie, you know. You know, you appear to me and you say, Ken, you were supposed to die 30 years from now. There's been a mistake. I feel like I I could maybe be like your uh, It's a Wonderful Life situation where I'm just trying to get my wings and I'm just pushing you around. <laughs> Ken is your George Bailey. Here's what would have happened <laughs> if you had never tried out for Jeopardy, George. Yeah, exactly. None of us want to want to live in that world. But how did this idea come about? What made you think this is the book I want to write for number 13. I was in an airport newsstand a few years ago, and I actually saw one of those bucket list books where it's like 100 of these things you have to see or do before you die. But I was looking at it upside down, and I thought it said 100 places to die before you see. And I thought, that's a fun idea. So it's the hacky thing where the author has the title first and then created the book to match it. But you know, I've always been really fascinated by human imagination about the afterlife. You know, I love mythology as a kid. And, uh, you know, I love mysteries, right? Like Gen X kids remember growing up in a world of time life books and 
you're always worried about UFOs and that you think the Bermuda Triangle is going to be a very big part of your life. Who built the pyramids? These were all top of mind for us in the 1980s. And the biggest mystery of all, of course, was, was death. You know, what, what happens out there in the world to come? Haunted houses and astral planes and heaven and hell and all the rest. So it's something that's fascinated me my whole life. Did you learn anything along the way or was there anything that you came across that was particularly interesting? Yeah, my, my favorite thing about writing is just getting to go down a rabbit hole and you know, for a moment, I feel like the Jeopardy writer is getting to just read the weirdest stuff imaginable and hope that they'll get a clue out of it. And uh, yeah, you know, just afterlives ranging from early Inuit civilizations in Alaska all the way up to the afterlife in Black Panther comics, the Disneyland ride where you go to hell. I'm sure Buzzy knows which ride that is. That would oh, be yeah, Mr. Toad's Mr. Wild Toad's Ride. Toad's Wild. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm talking to two Disneyland pros here. The, I think that my favorite fact I learned, and this could be a Jeopardy clue, I think, the reason why so many cultures think that the underworld lies across a river, you know how often there's a ferry yeah. to take you across a river to, to the Inferno or to Hades or whatever it is. It's because um, in early civilizations, when people dug a hole, they knew they got to six feet under, uh, and then they got to a, a level of water, like if they were digging a well. So they knew that if the dead were traveling downward from the tomb to whatever comes next, oh. it would have to cross an aquifer. And so that became the river Styx or whatever. Very interesting. I'm learning things already. Uh, by the way, I could totally see a uh, places to see after you die category crossover with Ken presenting his own. Clue. Here's Ken presenting a clue. <laughs> In the afterlife, instead of sending the clue crew to the Smithsonian, we're going to send Ken to the next world by dropping a grand piano on him. Yeah. So... I do have a question. You you cover such a unique range of things. There's, as you mentioned, mythology, religion, movies. You even, I was very happy to see music. You talk about like heaven, the, the talking head song. Did any of these like very disparate things seem to actually be connected? Like, oh, the bardo and, you know, something in this, you know, cartoon from the 70s actually kind of have a similar structure. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned the talking head song Heaven, which is where heaven is a bar where nothing ever happens. And that's an idea that I came across in multiple, mostly modern sources. The idea that eternity might just be too long. It might be like the bar where you want to go home, but you can't, you know, because it lasts forever. That's something that Milton and Dante didn't really consider. One thing I noticed in a lot of 20th century afterlives is there's a lot more bureaucracy. <laughs> the idea that heaven would have clerks and clipboards and computers. That's uh, That comes up in Twilight Zone episodes, but it's also in books and movies. There's a Philip K. Dick novel that has a bardo very much like the Tibetan bardo, but I think that's that's because he believed in that stuff, yeah. You've now visited, essentially through study, 100 places to see after you die. Where do you want to end up, if you could choose? I mean, it's like choosing a vacation. You know, it depends on the individual. I think my personal preference is very specific to me. I can't recommend this to a mass audience, but for me, you could not beat the baseball diamond in field of dreams. Mm. Like this is very consistent with my aesthetic and my interests watching old timey ball players emerge from the corn and banter with each other and, and check some fly balls. It sounds a little bit boring, but that's exactly what I'm looking for in, in heaven. I think. All right. For eternity. Are you playing or are you keeping score? Oh, I don't think I could play. You know, <laughs> maybe they'll let me be the bat boy or something. How about a catch? Is that your moment? You're going to play catch with? With who? Uh, Kevin Costner. That's right. Mike yeah, I'm, I'm going to wait for Kevin Costner to predecease yeah. me. Kevin's heaven is playing catch with Ken Jennings. He's always <laughs> saying that in interviews. It's getting a little weird. He shows up on my front lawn. Come on, Kevin. You got Yellowstone. So you have a busy week ahead with the book dropping tomorrow. You've got uh, a publicity tour. You're going to be back here in L.A. Yeah, I'm headed to New York tomorrow to be on The View and do some other media stuff. And then I've got signings here in L.A. at Skylight Books. And then over the rest of the week, I'm in Salt Lake City, Seattle, and Portland. If you're in any of those places, please come say hi. Tell them, tell them Buzzy and Sarah sent you. <laughs> yeah, get a signed copy. Well, aside from the book release, we're coming up on the end of your first official season as Jeopardy host. What's it been like? Up until now, the interview has been outside Jeopardy, and now we're inside. We've crossed the river Styx. <laughs> we kept digging. Yeah, I think Jeopardy is my afterlife. It's, um, you know, hopefully reruns forever. No, I just remember at first being terrified and uh, and unhappy to to have anybody but Alex Trebek hosting Jeopardy. I, I've said many times that I didn't want to be there either. I Those are big shoes to fill. 
And I still believe that, but largely thanks to the support of, of Sarah and everybody else at Jeopardy, I no longer feel that same terror when I go out there. I feel like, oh, I've got a great support staff of people who have been doing this in many cases for decades, who are unlike me experts at this, and they've got my back, and probably this is going to go pretty well. And it's it's the same as being a contestant. If you can just let go of your fear and try to have fun with it, you play better. And it, it turns out that's true of hosting as well. I'm, I'm having a blast. I don't think it was ever more apparent of the enjoyment you were having as host as during Masters. I mean, that was obviously as a host to see that level of gameplay. And then for us as viewers to watch you host at that level, it was kind of the best of both worlds. What was that like from your perspective? You don't normally see, you know, playing on Jeopardy for a contestant is such a baffling experience that they don't really get to loosen up and have fun. They're delightful people in real life, but that's just They're not, not a great taking social, their shoes yeah. off. It's not a cocktail party, you know? Yeah, nobody's taking off their shoes. Nobody's roasting the host. Um, nobody's doing wrestling poses usually on Jeopardy, and that's fine. <laughs> but uh, it's nice to have a group where they can cut loose and be funny because for the viewer, you get the sense of what it might be like to hang out with them. You know, it's like Jeopardy as a podcast where you have a parasocial relationship <laughs> with these folks and you feel like they're your friends and you get a sense of some of the rivalries and the friendships. I really enjoyed it. Ken, I do want to throw out just a few weeks ago on This is Jeopardy, another Jeopardy podcast, we uh, revisited your historic run. I know you've uh, obviously talked about your time <laughs> on Jeopardy a ton, but was it weird to kind of hear those voices and hear those little game clips again? The, hearing the audio clips from the show was the weirdest thing. Because in most cases, I was not watching every night while I was on Jeopardy. Not that I don't love Jeopardy, but often it was on during dinner and I was, more to the point, I was sick of myself. So many of those clips I hadn't heard since they happened and I had no memory of them. You know, me um, fibbing to Alex about liking airplane food <laughs> or offering to buy my wife a drink. Like, I, it's all kind of a blur. You know, I, it wasn't like that never happened. I, re I recognized something there. But it was just like a, a fond reunion. It was lovely to hear Alex's voice and, and to yeah. relive that summer. Well, that summer, as we said, nearly 20 years ago, but we knew then, or you knew then, authorship was in your future. We didn't know being our host was in your future. But I have to say, I think you're hitting it out of the park in both areas. Absolutely. Very excited about this new book. Thanks for spending a bit of time with us here in the pod. Thanks for having me. 100 places to see after you die. Thanks, Ken. Oh, it is always so great to spend some time with Ken, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And as a reminder, you can check out his book, 100 Places to See After You Die, tomorrow. All right, let's answer some viewer questions. Let's do it. Mark asks, while I was listening to Buzzy's podcast, Smart This is Man. Jeopardy, about the day in the life of a contestant, I wondered if the Masters tournament followed the tradition and did any practice rounds before the tapings. Great question, Mark. We actually did a short rehearsal game with our Masters on what was like the press and promo day. Right. And the thought behind that was that all of them, with the exception of James, had played recently, but we wanted to completely level the opportunity. So we wanted them each to have had a rehearsal in the shortest or same amount of distance mm -hmm. from when they went on to play. I will say it proved to be an even more challenging rehearsal because we also were shooting our red camera footage where we got mm. those really dynamic shots of all of the masters. So, you know, here they are trying to play a rehearsal game with Ken and they've got a camera in their face and they've got a camera blocking the board. So I guess it was appropriate for masters. We really just kind of leveled up the, even the <laughs> rehearsal like this is not regular jeopardy this is masters you have to be able to play this game whether or not you can see the board or the clue and just keep your focus and obviously they all did pretty well <laughs> they did great well ari asks are there plans to restore the three contestant podiums back into one set piece you know ari it's so funny because we used that one piece for so many years and then when we first separated them obviously because of covid it seemed like our contestants were miles apart. It just seemed so different and so strange. And yet, as time went on, we really found that we liked it. One thing, we had switched to 16 by 9, you know, HD over time with the show. So the camera angles are wider. And when we were all in one set piece, you know, to get those individual ISO shots of each of the contestants, you often were kind of seeing half of mm -hmm. the other contestant. If you're on a shot of contestant three, you're seeing half of contestant two. And so we really find it gives us cleaner contestant shots. And, you know, once you see something another way, 
I can't unsee it. I, I like them separated. Mm. How do you feel? I like it. I, you know, it brings to mind what Ari's question brings to mind to me is: Is there a chance of our host Ken or Mayim going back to doing the interviews, standing in front of the lectern? Podia? Well, the interesting thing about that is that the host would have to travel further between each of the podiums as they moved from one contestant to the next. You know, everything with COVID really didn't wrap up until our last two days of taping this season. <laughs> yeah. Certainly something we will look at in the off season. You know, how good are Ken and Maya at walking backwards <laughs> while <laughs> shuffling through cards and making sure not to fall off the ledge because right, that's the there other is thing. That ledge there. We didn't have that step up uh-huh. prior to when Alex used to, you know, walk between. Yeah. So I think it would take a little choreography practice to see how that works out, but I like the question, Ari. I like your question, Buzzy. (laughs) And um, we'll get to the bottom of it for season 40. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. As always, we'll be back next Monday for more gameplay discussion. Yes, we will find out if Suresh can secure his TOC qualifying fifth win. As always, subscribe to the podcast, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social, follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on TikTok. And send us your questions to Inside Jeopardy Podcast at gmail.com. See you next week. Have a good one. Hi, I'm Buzzy Cohen. You've heard me on Inside Jeopardy, breaking down stats, analyzing contestant plays, and reviewing key moments from recent games. Well, I'm hosting another Jeopardy podcast, but this one's a little bit different. Think less sports, more history. We'll be taking you on a journey from Jeopardy's beginning in the 1960s through the Alex Trebek years to its current day super champs. For the last 60 years, we've been watching one show. Hear how it all came together on This is Jeopardy, the story of America's favorite quiz show. Out now from Sony Music Entertainment and Sony Pictures TV. Hey, Ken, what's that thing the kids say? You mean smash the like, subscribe, and bell button so you'll be the first to know when we upload more great videos? Yeah, that's it. Do that. 